These are the uh, things that we're going to talk about uh, in the next 20 minutes or so. First, we're going to talk about some of the uh, general aspects of procedural sedation, and then uh, there's a specific uh, curriculum piece on ketamine, propofol, and ketafol, and nitrous oxide. We're going to just separate those out and talk about them for a bit. So first, let's talk about the, uh, the generalities and, and patient selection, which is really the, the, the main take-home point that I want to make. So the first thing is, is that when you give a drug for procedural sedation, you're giving an induction agent, so this is a, a very similar and related to RSI. These two things are very overlapping, aren't they? Because they have similar airway issues and stuff. Um, you have to, I think the bottom line is, you guys know when you're filling out your credentialing forms in the hospital that they keep changing the name, right? It was like deep sedation, moderate sedation, moderate to deep. Um, I mean, there's other names too, but they're all irrelevant because the fact is, is if you're an emergency uh, doc and you're giving something for the procedure, you have to be prepared to manage the airway. You have to be prepared that they go to the deepest plane of anesthesia because you can't predict. It's unsafe to not be prepared for that. And so this whole concept that there's some difference between a you know, procedural sedation and the procedure that is taken in the operating room with the anesthesiologist, it, there isn't really. It's, it's really, it's part of the same standard of care. Now, this is just uh, an example of something that is not procedural. This is the absolute worst uh, use of these drugs uh, without monitoring in a home. Uh, Michael Jackson was using propofol and he was getting administered propofol without monitoring and obviously very, very dangerous drug. Propofol, and that, you know, that kind of thing is, um, that's not good for us when those drugs get bad press, right? And with propofol, we went through a very, very difficult time in emergency medicine. The actual vial of the propofol would say on it, if you look at the old vials, it says, for use only by anesthesiologists. I mean, you know, they really said that right on the vial. Um, and so, you know, the stakes are high. Now, just like when I was talking about RSI, I was talking about preparation and airway, and the same is true of procedural sedation. But just like in my conversation about RSI, the issue is not really one of preparation in terms of having all the stuff, it's whether you should be doing it in the first place, whether you should be doing RSI and paralyzing someone in the, in the first place, and in this case, whether or not you should be doing this procedure in the first place. Because let's be honest, the big mistakes in medicine, the big you know, clusters that we have to deal with after, are when a crucial decision was made wrong to give a medication, to intubate, to not intubate. Those are, you know, when we make big mistakes in terms of our pathways, not the subtle things that we tend to argue about all the time, the dose of this, the dose of that. What about making a decision not to do a procedure? That's much more consequential. So along those lines, I want to emphasize that you're going to really use your judgment when you're doing this. And there's no hard and fast rules. There's the elements that you're going to use to make your decision of whether or not you're going to do something. But there's no hard and fast rules or formulae that you can plug in. It really is a matter of common sense. And you know what? Just to think about that in general, when we talk about the decision to intubate someone, I mean, Diane went through, you know, sort of if you, if you put it into words, she put down what the words are, the oxygen, the ventilation, the impending problem that they're going to need it for. But let's face it, no decision is as subtle and is as uh, important as that decision that we make as ER docs to tube someone or not to tube, right? These are very, very important uh, consequential decisions. And unlike RSI, where this is a patient who you have to intubate, I mean, th there's, no, you know, there's no real choice. You can't wake them up. Uh, you're going down this pathway, come hell or high water, you're gonna have to deal with it. But remember, this is a bit different. This is an option. Okay, if we're talking about doing a procedure, we're talking about an option. We're talking about a branch point decision making. And you're not supposed to be able to see this slide. I'm going to zoom in on it. But this is the anesthesiologist um, difficult algway, uh, airway algorithm. And you'll notice that when they go through their decision making, there's always a place for canceling the case. Don't forget that. So when we're moving into the procedural sedation realm of things, we also have that out and that possibility sometimes of getting extra help, insisting that we go to the OR and thinking maybe it's not the best idea to do this procedure. So patient selection. 
we're talking about are they sick, their past medical history, if they're pregnant is something that really we need to separately identify because that really will change my decision making. I'm not, you know, very keen on doing a, a big procedure on a, a very gravid woman in the ER. That's not my idea of fun. Um, last meal is important, although you probably know that um, we're generally not going to be not doing cases when we do them because of their NPO status, okay? And Canada was way ahead in this, by the way, in terms of them um, not fasting people for the operating room. They have protocols there where they don't necessarily fast people and they give them water before the OR because that actually does better things with the pH in your stomach. You know, when you don't eat and the pH of your stomach goes down, that actually makes it worse when you aspirate. And so part of the um, pre-anesthetic management might be uh, H2 blockers or PPIs, for example, to prevent that. But if we really need to do something, uh, generally speaking, if they have eaten some, an hour or two ago, it usually isn't something that uh, tips our hand not to do something. You should know the ASA classification. Um, and wherever you work, you've got a protocol for this. And so rather than you know, going through everything in exquisite detail, in each, in each, that's not the point. The point actually is to talk about the judgment and then for you to use your system at your hospitals to do this. You've got checklists, you've got nurse experts, you've got all kinds of people that you will help you do this and get the right paperwork so you don't miss things. So that I'm not as worried about. I know that you all know that. You need to know the ASA classification because you're always having to, that's something that always goes on, that, on those forms, the consent forms. Um, and basically it's uh, fairly straightforward. A healthy patient is a one. Uh, a two would be someone like with diabetes who takes a medicine but otherwise as well. Um, a patient three would be a severe diabetic who's had really complications, amputations, that type of thing, but they're currently stable. A four would be someone like, say, DKA. You know, they're really sick. They're acutely sick um, on top of that. And a five is, you know, when we take our really bad traumas in, you know, they're fives. You know, someone's got a pressure of 60 and they might not live. Well, that's a five. Are we going to not do the case because they're a five? Well, there might not be an option. You might have to, right? But if it's a procedural sedation case, you might have an option. So this is in visual form what I was talking about in the RSI lecture, because the same rules apply. If you are going to do, you know, say you've got a, someone with a lack in front of you, and you notice that their neck looks like that, and they've got, you know, uh, impossible to put a, a mask around their face, or they've got that thing over, if they've got any of those features, it means the exact same thing to you in, in uh, procedural sedation as it does in RSI. I'm not going to do procedural sedation on that dude in the middle. That's for sure. I know that much. I might do it on the guy on the right, because if I can bag him and I can tube him, he looks otherwise okay, okay, I might be okay with that. Um, but the concept here is that if you're going to take someone down to potentially the deepest planes of anesthesia, well, guess what? This is the same as RSI, because you might need to intubate them, you might need to manage that airway, right? So there is no difference here. And I look at these patients going into procedure the same way I look at the patients going into RSI, and you should too. This, I didn't specifically mention the lemon rule because it's, it's, it gets really criticized in emergency medicine because, you know, sometimes they can't open their mouth to cooperate with this. Sometimes they're in a, in a collar. And so there's all kinds of reasons that we can't get a good lemon score. But the lemon score is what the anesthesiologists have used to predict the hard tube. And so if they have a lot of uh, badness in the lemon as well as the hard to crike, hard to, uh, to bag, then they would be a problem. So this is the, this is the, the funnest part. Um, and, I, and I really recommend that you, we're going to play a little experimental game. We're going to take this case and we're going to decide if we're going to do procedural sedation and how. And this exercise is one I want you to go through every time you're approaching um, the patient for a procedural sedation. And go this mental process. And what it, really, it, what it really is, is you know, what is going on with this patient? What will happen if I do this and it works out good? What will happen if I do this and it works out bad? You think about all the possibilities, and then you decide the pathway you're going to go down. So let's say this patient came in. Um, we talked a little bit about hip dislocations earlier with Ken. And he got a hip dislocation, OK? Uh, it's not a prosthetic hip. It's his native hip. Why is that important? Because a prosthetic hip can't die. It's prosthetic, right? Uh, so I'm not as worried about the timing. But with this, there's a time issue. Right? About six hours, maybe some would say, but we know that as time goes on, the chance of this hip becoming necrotic, getting avascular necrosis, goes up and up and up and up. So there's a real urgency to get this hip back in, or else this gentleman might lose his hip. Okay, so that's a priority, right? Now, it turns out that so many of the procedures that we do are like this, right? I mean, there's, there's, time, or, there's time limits on wounds, there's time as a consideration for so many of these things, and that plays into the decision making, okay? Now, say, for example, this gentleman was a high ASA. Maybe he's real sick. Maybe there's all kinds of medical problems. Maybe he's, that, maybe he's diabetic, and maybe he is in DKA, okay? 
So now you have a really high ASA and you have this guy, and then you've got yourself a decision. Wow, he's kind of high ASA, but his vitals are normal now, and should I do this? And if I do it, what agent do I use? Well, in a case like this, I probably would go ahead and do this, okay? Because you know, you just can't let this hip sit out like that for hours, and it's gonna take a long time to mobilize resources. Maybe that's something you can be charting. You know, you can say, look, you know, I've got an ortho pod that's three hours away, and there, you know, or an, an OR is three hours away, and this is a decision I'm making because we're three hours out. This patient is stable. We've consented him for this procedure because I've told him the risk of losing his hip. I'm gonna put it back in. And I think I would use something like propofol for him, would be reasonable. His pressure has been okay. He's not in shock, that would be reasonable, right? So interesting case, right? Because you, know, you could make arguments about that, but I wanna, I wanna uh, bring into focus these, these consequences, these decisions. This guy might have a dead hip after six hours, but you know, if I get into trouble here, is someone gonna look and say, hey, geez, this, this guy had no business here uh, doing this. It might even be that you, Consult, you, you talk with an orthopod on the phone and make a decision and, and document that as you go ahead and say, yeah, we, we, this is best for the patient and he agrees and we're gonna do it. Now let's say you have that same patient with the hip dislocation that comes in after a major trauma. Okay, so he's in there and he's got polytrauma, including the hip dislocation, the car accident, and the pressure's on the low side, and maybe 95, a soft pressure. Now what do you think about this? Right, it's a different situation, totally different. Maybe I tell you the guy was an ASA-1 to begin with. Well, who cares? He's jacked up now, isn't he? He's really sick. In fact, he's in shock. And so what are the potential consequences? Well, let's see. I could put the hip back in. Um, now, if I, if I use propofol with that patient, oh my, that would be a big mistake because it would drop out his pressure. I don't even know if he's bleeding through his spleen yet. I wouldn't give a patient like that something that's going to drop his pressure like propofol until after the scan and some stability has been demonstrated. Um, but you know what? I might be scared about giving him anything, to be honest. In a, in a situation like this, where a guy is potentially bleeding to death, he might need to go straight to the OR. And me focusing on this hip might be a problem. In fact, I, I, I drew it out for you. There's his hip. I drew it out for you. That's really what, what, what you're dealing with sometimes in that equation. And there's no right and wrong answers here, but I want to think, hey, what would potentially happen if I, like, here's a guy who needs to go to the CT, or here's a guy that needs to go to the OR, interventional radiology, and he potentially has a spleen, he potentially, right? Uh, I'm pointing to my liver as I say spleen, he potentially has a spleen. And, um, and, uh, and what, you know, what, what exactly needs to, you know, what, what would happen if I gave this guy ketamine and we spent 10 minutes doing this? Uh, you'd be criticized, right? You'd be, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, this guy's got life-threatening injuries. Um, sometimes we might put a hip back like, like that. We might put a hip back in. We might cheat. You know, we might do it during RSI, or we might do it uh, when the patient's had a little bit of fe uh, just a little bit of fentanyl, um, you know, in some circumstances, and you can get it back in, because it really is a problem for that guy. I mean, we really do want to get it back in, and the whole team is thinking the whole time, yes, we're going to find out what's bleeding, and we're going to fix it, but we also are going to get this damn thing back in as soon as we can. I mean, that, you can't lose it. And so that's really what I wanted. That's the main thing I wanted to share with you, is that, that process of, 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 of realizing how how subtle and how nuanced these things are, and how your judgment is everything when you're looking at these people. Now, in terms of what's required of us, I had mentioned this, the same standard applies. You know, it's not like you're going to uh, get into trouble in the case and they're going to say there's one standard for the ER and there's another standard for the uh, patients. What do you think an average patient would think about that? You mean I have more, I'm entitled to more safety in, the, in one place of the hospital? I mean, they, the public won't accept that. We have to have a uniform standard. So we have to really follow the rules that are set forth by the JC. And these are all the things that you'll find on your checklist. And, you know, these are things that protocols and systems do for you. It's the judgment that we do. It's the systems that make us not miss all the details. That's what, that's what this is all about. So monitoring is important, and you have to do all these things. You have to document. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about waveform capnography. Um, you know, there are some people that say that it's required. It's a standard. It's the, uh, the standard. In fact, some of those people happen to be the regulators, <laughs> and they say that you have to have waveform capnography. You're going to see it in the ORs. Um, I... I don't know, I, you remember that talk I gave yesterday where I was talking about um, looking at the patient instead of the monitor? It's the same with this. If you don't have waveform capnography, you have eyes. And when I do procedural sedation, the main thing here that we don't want to miss is that patients stop breathing, but their SATs still say 100, right? Because we've done a good job and they've got oxygen on and we're thinking, oh, they're fine, they're fine, 100%, 100%, 100%. No one notices that they're not breathing, right? And then we all know what happens, right? <laughs> The nurse said, oh my God, the sets just dropped to 60, and you're like, ooh. So you need to either put capnography on to make sure they're still breathing, or even better, actually observe their chest 
and see if it's rising and falling. I've never do procedural sedation. One of the things that the residents know is I always want to make sure I see the, I want to see the patient. I need to see the anatomy. I need to see the chest. I don't do this with a vest on because you really need to make sure that they're still breathing. Um, in terms of discharge uh, for all of these things, I wait a full day, like, you know, especially with kids, I tell them no activities for a full day. I mean, the evidence is, you know, uh, you don't have to go that long, but I think it's a really safe thing because there are subtle things that happen to people. You know, I don't want to give a kid ketamine and then have a major uh, accident on the sports field that later that afternoon. That's not cool. I want to give them a full 24 hours to wash all that stuff out. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about these agents. Um, the uh, propofol, which, um, you know, boy, is that ever wonderful. Um, the uh, big negatives we've covered, it really can drop their pressure out. You will never give someone one of these agents uh, for procedural sedation if you think they're potentially bleeding. If they're potentially shocky, you don't give propofol. You know, uh, the only ones that are really safe in that situation would be ketamine, right? Because ketamine tends to increase the blood pressure and increase the heart rate. And atomidate is a little more neutral. It's not perfect, but it's more neutral when it comes to blood pressure. So propofol you would never use in someone that you're afraid might be shocky or lose their, their pressure. And then the other thing about it, of course, is it gives you the deepest plane of, it can give you the deepest plane of anesthesia. You know, anesthesiologists can do a whole case on propofol, right? They, do, they often do a whole case on propofol. And you know, it's funny, we knew when propofol started being used by the anesthesiologists. I remember when they introduced it to Canada because it's just a funny story. When you go into, when you're an, I was an intern working there as a GP, and you'd go into the post-anesthetic recovery room, and what are patients are like after anesthetic? Um, they're, they're groggy, they pukey, uh, they're, you know, it's pretty nasty, they're starting to realize they're in agony and they're pain, right? and all of a sudden when they introduced propofol for all the procedures, all the patients were like up and proposing to the nursing staff is immediately after it's, it, it, it goes, it, it takes you out and it takes you back up and, you're, and you tend to be on the kind of the flirtatious side when you get out of it. So it's kind of a neat thing, um, but it does give that deepest plane of anesthesia. Now for ketamine, um, it's really kind of, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's the other side of the spectrum, right? It raises blood pressure in the heart rate, so it's a lot safer uh, in general, okay? Um, I, I did a, a brief stint out in uh, Russia, actually, and every single one of their OR cases was exclusively done with ketamine and nothing else. They had no other agents. So this also can be used and is used throughout the world for a general anesthetic. But it's much safer, as you know. And whenever I give ketamine, you can see those other vials, I always have some atropine ready um, because they can get really secretionous. Is that a new word I just made up? And uh, midazolam, because sometimes when they come out of this uh, ketamine, they, are, they, can, they can freak out. Um, so the big thing about ketamine is, uh, unlike prof profile doesn't lo lower the pressure, but it's also used as a general anesthetic. Um, and you maintain your airway reflexes. So I think that you get the impression that ketamine is a really important drug, right? And it's really helpful. And you heard that whole discussion about delayed sequence of debation. But I want to caution you, there's, there's, there's almost too much enthusiasm, to be honest, about ketamine out there. And we've got all kinds of paramedics that are using it in protocols in the field. We've got people showing up into the ERs with Glasgow coma scales of three because they've been getting ketamine in the field and we're not sure what to do with them. Ketamine's not benign. Sometimes they stop breathing. Sometimes they throw up and aspirate. So, you know, it's not a free shot, like I think some people think it is. It, it needs a consideration. So, of course, because these things tend to have the kind of complementary adverse effects, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea came up to use them together. This has been kind of fully vetted at this point in time. And you can use this as an option, this ketafol, where you use the two together, you use about a half dose of each, but the literature doesn't show any great advantage, honestly. We thought that if you used a smaller dose at each of these, it would mitigate the side effects of both. In fact, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. They're all safe. Ketamine is safe, propofol is safe, and ketafol is safe. They all are safe when used properly. Um, and so uh, I don't like it. I don't use it for that reason. I mean, there's no compelling reason. And why would I want to use something with two doses of something rather than one? It's always more complicated. And you know what? Just along those same lines, um, you might be interested to know that RSI, when it first came out and we were residents and learning about RSI, it was like a freaking textbook. You do this, and then you wait 30 seconds, you do this, you do this, and you know there's those four pre-treatment medications. Those detailed, complex protocols are dangerous because if you don't intubate someone 10 times a day, you know, you're not used to those things. All those steps hurt the patient. The simpler is better. And so I think that that goes for both procedural sedation and for RSI. Uh, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. And then ketophol. And then nitrous way underused here. I totally agree with Rick. Another shocker when I came down from Canada to the US was where's the nitrous? 
We used it for lots of things, and we used it for deliveries. We used it for, because I used to do some OB, and we, I used it for the, uh, for the women in labor, and it's fantastic. Um, it comes in a 50-50 mix. Um, there's very few contraindications. Uh, one contraindication is a roommate that I had in college who got addicted to them, uh, and uh, he would sit on the couch and he'd go, because <laughs> you know your voice goes high and then low, and you go, <laughs> and then the, the local department store in the town we were living in wanted to know why all of their uh, whipped cream uh, making kits were all gone off stock because someone had bought them all, and it was my buddy who was smoking all of their uh, nitrous oxide. But that's the pregnant woman, and she's and she and the great thing about nitrous is that it auto titrates. You know, like as you get, um, without going into the, 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 the details, you go unconscious before you, uh, you stop, you basically auto-titrate because you start getting drowsy and then you stop puffing on the, on the peace pipe. And so you can't really overdose on it if you're using it as a, as a solo agent. If you're using it with other things, you can, you know, you have to consider that. I gave morphine, I gave a lot of it, I gave nitrous, right? It can add up. But just on its own, it's real safe, and that's why the dentists um, are so fond of it. Um, I do have one contraindication slide. There's one thing that you need to know is that it's interesting because nitrous is a gas and it's a gas with a different density than air, right? And so the complications relate to that. And if you have a patient with trapped gas, pneumothorax, small bowel obstruction, think about what, what do when you're inhaling a gas of a thinner uh, nature. And so it can cause problems in patients that have uh, these two conditions, because they have retained air that's going to get uh, admixed with a, a different density and could cause uh, um, problems. So that's that. But uh, really great drug, and you should use it. So just in summary, um, one take-home message. Next time you go back, even if it's like a relatively simple case where you're doing it, just do that mental exercise. So what would happen if I didn't do this? What would happen if I did do this? And, and think out the, the possibilities. And, um, and if you get into that habit, you'll probably avoid a major mistake, like I've made quite a few of these, okay? Major judgment errors. Uh, it's part of the learning process in a trauma center, but, um, you know, if you make that a habit every time of looking at the airway and looking, can I, can I tube, can I beg, can I crike? Is this something I have to do? You know, if you do that, wow, wow, you will, you will just be great. And you are great. And thank you very much for your attention.